All right, so uh, thanks for all being here this afternoon. Um, so that passage will come in, in play a little bit later, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Um, but the sermon I've got today is called, What is Truth? So I'll get you to turn to John chapter 18. But it's something that I just found absolutely amazing through all the books authored by the Apostle John, um, that he speaks of these things. And Pilate here, he makes a foolish statement. Um, but it is a question that we actually can answer. What is truth? And the Apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one that was closest to our Lord when he was on this earth, he's the one who leaned upon his breast at the Last Supper. Um, the biggest emphasis of his books is faith and truth. Um, and it's no coincidence that the person closest to the Word of God, who is truth, would emphasize truth, Amen. and especially the truth of his first-hand witness. So you'll be there in John chapter 18, look at verse 33, and we'll read here where Pilate makes his statement. It says, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of, thee, of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom from hence. So, you know, he's obviously he was brought before Pilate, and Pilate, you know, wants to know, is this guy going to be a king? Is he going to try and usurp my authority here on earth? And Jesus is like, look, no, my kingdom's not here. It's another kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. We've heard that preached over recent weeks as well. You know, Brother Jason preached that we're just passing through, you know, so... That was what Jesus' kingdom is. It's, it's the kingdom that's in heaven. Um, in verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find no fault in him at all. So what is truth? And while, while the statement from Pilate is foolish, you know, this is a man that's full of pride and he thought he knew truth. Truth was in fact standing right in front of him. But Jesus said he came to bear witness of the truth and that everyone of the truth hears his voice. If you're saved, then you hear the voice of truth. The voice of the shepherd, you know, when he declares the Father and his word unto us. And Jesus makes that clear many times. But how many times do you go out soul winning and you meet those so-called educated people who think they know the truth, they think they have the truth, but they don't know the truth? You know, so these might be people who trust in their works, they think they know the truth, but there's also that fool who believes there is no God. But truth comes by the word of God and wisdom and understanding through faith in his word. So you have to read the scriptures with the heart of faith to understand the teachings of God. You know, if you close your heart to the true God, he will not reveal his truth to you. And there's a phrase that Jesus used so often when he's walking about the earth and teaching people. He says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. You know, so we should carry that same attitude when we go out soul winning or when we're teaching the truth of God. If they don't have an ear to hear, then they're not worthy of hearing the truth. You know, the word, the word of truth is for those who actually want to hear, who are willing to hear the word of God. But again, we come back to what is truth? You know, it's a question that really is worth answering. So in John 14, 6, Jesus made this statement among many others. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in another, in another, in another place, John 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we've got the words of the Father, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Holy Ghost. These are truth. And the word of truth is something that comes up many times, and it's always described as the words of the Lord. Um, Jesus himself also being the, the Word made flesh. So we'll look at some now. We'll get you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that's speaking of the scripture. 
You know, you've got to rightly divide the word. And in order to do that, you need to read it and you need to study it. And you have the Holy Ghost who will help you rightly divide. If you want to turn over to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12. In Ephesians 1, 12, it reads that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. So the very gospel we believe in is the word of truth. And Jesus is the truth. That includes his virgin birth, his perfect and sinless life, his death on the cross. It includes his burial, his death, his resurrection, which is a physical resurrection of the body. All of this is truth, and this is what saves us. This is the gospel, and this is the truth. And Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the Son of God. He was made flesh to die and rise again for us, to be our mediator. He sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat, which cries out forever for us. And I, I mean, I preached on the blood of Christ last time. Um, but these are things that you believe. You know, you receive the Holy Spirit of promise which witnesses to you, to your spirit, that Jesus is truth, that everything that Jesus said is true, that the word of God is truth. And that's the job of the Holy Ghost. In James 1.18, it says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Um, so yeah, when we're born again of that incorruptible seed of God, that word of God, we're born of the word of truth. It says he begat he us with the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creature. So he wanted us to be like him in his glorified state. And our ability to do that comes through faith in the word of truth. And that's where the old man, he can only transgress the word of the Lord. He can only transgress the law of God. But the new man is perfect like Christ. We are created like him, begat by the word of God, that incorruptible seed. You know, because he's born of truth. And that's why he'll inherit the kingdom of God, but flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's the old man. So in Psalms 119, verse 41, I'll get you to turn to 1 Thessalonians 2. I'll just read to you from Psalms 119, verse 41. It says, Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word, and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. So the promises of God, that's for us who are of faith, and they mean everything to us. You know, that comes everything from the judgments of God to the salvation of God, the redemption, you know, of our bodies to come, and the redemption of our souls, which he paid for on the cross. You know, so he's preserved all the words of the Lord for us. He's preserved his truth. That's why we need to read the scriptures while we have access to them. We need to memorize them, meditate on them, and just keep them in your heart. So you're there in 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So I'll get you to turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. But the word of God came not from men, it came from God. And we receive that as in truth, the word of God. We don't receive it as the word of men, because it is the word of God. So I'll read to you from 2 Peter 1.21. It says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the author of the word of God, the author of the word of truth. And also in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, it says, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So God spoke to us by the Old Testament prophets, you know, and that's the, all the Old Testament books from Genesis to Malachi. 
But God spoke to us in the New Testament through the witnesses of Christ, those who were with him, those who witnessed. They witnessed his, uh, his life, his death, burial and resurrection. These are people, you know, like John, who give us the great witness of Christ, the testimony of Christ. And that's how we know it's truth. You know, these are the men closest to Christ when he was on this earth. And while the authors of the books were men, that true author is God. He's the Holy Ghost who moved men to speak these words and then they were recorded for us. And that's how we can trust that it's truth. So you'll be there in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. It says, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So why, why is he teaching us this? The context, of course, is deceivers and antichrists who come in to subvert the truth. But also every lie is not of the truth. You know, and God is truth. God is, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. You know, so one of the most important truths is to understand that God is truth and he cannot lie. So in John 3, 21, it says, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. In Titus 1, 2, we have that very strong scripture, which we, a lot of us use out soul winning as well. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Saviour. And Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17, says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. So we're the heirs of the promise. So we're the, you know, we're the heirs of the promise of, made unto Abraham, of which Christ is the seed. But in 6.18, it says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation we who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So again, we know that God cannot lie. It's one of the immutable things. Just God cannot lie. In him is no darkness at all. But also, that's the promises of God are an anchor for our soul, and that'll come up again later. But that's why it's so important for us, because we can be sure and steadfast in the promises of God, knowing that he cannot lie. Every promise he's made, we can trust him. And all three persons of the Godhead are truth. And that's why we can trust God and his precious words. He left us with his commandment of truth. You know, in, in 2 John 1, 1, it says, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. So when it says the truth dwells in us and shall be with us forever, that's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Spirit of promise. He's going to guide us into all truth. He's the one who's going to speak of the things that Jesus spoke of, and he's going to guide us into those things. It says if you're saved, you have the, you know, you have the truth, and that's why salvation is actually referred to as enlightenment. Because you receive the truth, you're, the scales come off your eyes and you're actually awake. You're alert. You're, you're no longer in darkness, but you're in light. And, you know, that's why he sends the Holy Ghost, the comforter, the earnest of our inheritance. He's there to teach us all things and to guide his children into truth. Because you know, God doesn't hide the truth from us. If you want to turn to, to 2 John chapter 1, verse 3. I'll read to you from John 16. This is Jesus saying, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So, of course, the apostles, they received those things to come, and, of course, that was spoken by the Holy Ghost and then recorded for us. That's our New Testament. No, but that's, that's the thing. We have the, the truth that dwells in us and shall be with us forever. And that is that, that uh, comforter, that Holy Ghost of promise. In 2 John chapter 1, verse 3, 
It says, Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. So we have a commandment to walk in truth according to the Father's words. You know, these commandments, they come through Jesus Christ and the word of God with the new man accomplishing those commandments. That's the only way we can ever keep commandments is through that new man walking in the spirit and killing off the old man every day. But there is a commandment to walk in truth. And that commandment's not just a New Testament commandment, that's actually an old commandment. That's an Old Testament commandment. It was given to them as well. If you want to just turn over to 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. It says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. So it's so important that we understand what truth is. That truth is unchanging. Truth is the word of God, and the word of God is truth. Jesus is the word of God, and Jesus is truth. God our Father is truth, and the Holy Ghost is truth. And God and truth are inseparable. You cannot separate God and truth, because God is the author of all truth. Amen. And God cannot lie, but he speaks only truth. You know, as it says, in, in, in him is light, and there's no darkness at all. So what I want to do now is just go through a few truths that are obviously strong and necessary truths. And I just hope it helps to strengthen your faith in God's word and God's truth. So the first truth is that Jesus, the Son of God, has always existed and was manifested in the flesh approximately 2,000 years ago. So if you want to turn to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. So in Genesis 1, 1, and most people would know this by heart, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Um, so go down to verse 26. But just remember it says God created the heaven and the earth. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his, in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So right away, the first chapter of this whole book you know, of the Bible, God sets the tone. He says there is a God, and that's the Son of God, we'll see here soon. Um, but he creates the heaven and the earth and everything that is in them. And you know, also the plurality of them saying, let us make man in our image. You know, that's a plural speaking. He's not speaking as, you know, let me make man in my image. You know, th there's a plurality there. And we see, we will see in a second that that's the Son of God and the Father, you know, speaking to each other. And Adam was formed in the image of the Son because God is a spirit. The Father is a spirit, whereas, you know, it speaks of the Son. You know, the Son has always manifested himself as a man whether it be Melchizedek, whether it be when he was in the fiery furnace, whether it be, you know, any, any time you see Jesus, he's always manifested as a man. And Adam was made, he's the second Adam. You know, Adam was made in his image. And you will see that. But if you want to turn to John chapter 1, verse 1, and we'll see John also, you know, it's very interesting. You've got Genesis 1 and you've got John 1. Um, they're both speaking of the creation in John 1.1 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So just go down to verse 10. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, 
which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This is he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. So there's just so much truth in that short beginning of the chapter of John. You know, we see that Jesus is the word of God. But Jesus was with the Father in the beginning. And Jesus was manifested in the flesh. And that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God. And Jesus is the creator of all things. So, I mean, that's why when you read that God created the heaven and the earth, that's Jesus saying, and there's other places where it says the same thing. Jesus was the one who created the earth. You know, and that's why no one's seen the Father, you know, but the Son, he has declared him. Um, but people have seen the Son, people have seen the one who manifested himself with the flesh when he came down with those angels and spoke with, with Abraham face to face when he went and destroyed Sodom. Like, there are times where the, the Son has been seen and he was always manifested as a man. But it, when he came 2,000 years ago, it, it was a special manifestation, but uh, I won't get into too much of that today. Um, but if you want to turn to First John chapter 1, we see in Hebrews 11.3, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And the word of God is another name of Jesus. It says, So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And in Hebrews 1.10, it says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. You know, so the Gospel of John and the other books of John, they're not only written that we might believe, that's what the Gospel of John is written for, that's the purpose of it, but it's also the most clear presentation we have as Jesus as God and Jesus as the Son of God and Jesus as the Word of Truth, the Word made flesh among us. So in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. So who can you describe there? You can't describe the Father there. You can't describe the Holy Ghost there. You can only describe the Son of God as the one that they have actually handled and looked upon. Um, that's when Jesus was manifested on this earth. He's called the word of life. He's called the word of truth. He's called the word of God. Um, these are things that Jesus Christ has referred to many times throughout Scripture. So, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Uh, sorry, no, I just skipped ahead. Uh, 1 John 1, 2. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Now the unsaved, they don't understand, but we understand that there is a Father in heaven and he has a Son. There's a Son who's always existed, who was with him in the beginning. That Son is the one who created the heavens and the earth and was manifested on earth as a man to die for our sins. You know, he was raised from the dead and now he's in heaven with the Father, sitting on his right hand to intercede for us and the brethren, were his brethren that are born of God through faith. And this is the story of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. You're not going to find a contradiction in that story. This is that same Jesus. The one who came and died for us is the same one who created this earth, the same one who was in the beginning with God. There is a Father, there is a Son, there is a Holy Ghost, there is a Trinity. If you don't believe that, then you've got big problems. Because that's a basic doctrine, and that's something you actually must believe. Like, how stupid do you have to be to ignore the scripture that says, you know, he was manifested for us. But it says, we have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, he was, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Like, the Bible's so clear, but you've you got to hate Christ to actually deny that he's the Son of God. There's just no way around it. That's why the Bible calls you an antichrist, if you deny that. In 1 John chapter 2, says, I've not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. 
who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which we have heard from the beginning, in that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you. You also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. So no lie is of the truth, but we as his children, we abide in truth. And the truth abides in us. Um, you know, and it says, like, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Like, Christ dwells in us, the Spirit of God resides in us and dwells with us. That Spirit of truth, it says, is with, with us to the end. You know, and there's a promise of God that we have eternal life, that we are saved and will continue in the Son. You know, and there are liars who deny that Jesus is the Christ. They deny that he's truth. They deny that Jesus is God. And they deny that Jesus is the Son of God. But we walk in truth and we believe all those things to be true. So if you want to turn to, actually just, yeah, turn to John chapter 8. I don't know, it just makes me so angry when I hear people denying that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, you know. It's just, it's disgusting. It is a doctrine of devils. And these people are not only not saved, but they're reprobate who deny the Father and the Son. In John 8, verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not, which of you convinceth me, convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. You therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. How many times do you try and correct these people, and they just completely deny? They will not receive the word of God. They don't receive the truth. They didn't receive it from Jesus. They're not going to receive it from us. But God's people, they hear the word of truth. It says they hear them not because they're not of God. But we're of God. We have the Spirit of God. So we know when we hear the truth of God that the Spirit speaks with our spirit and says, yeah, this is the truth. That's how we know the truth. But liars and antichrists, they deny the words of God. You know, they deny the Father of the Son, they deny the deity of Christ, they deny the resurrection, and they don't abide in truth. And they make God a liar when they believe not the witness of God's word and God's Son. So, of course, we have in First John chapter 5, you know, you've got the, the three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood on this earth. You've got the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in heaven, which are the three witnesses there. But it says that in First John 5, verse 10, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. That's that Holy Ghost of promise. And that's how we can understand the truth. It says, He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and that this life is in his Son. So, and this is again, same Apostle John. He was close to Jesus. He walked with him on this earth. He was with him from the beginning. And nobody emphasizes the Son of God more or the truth more than John in the Scriptures. Because you can see that man understood who Christ is. He knew Christ. And that's what we can aim to as well through his word to get to know Christ the way John knew Christ, the way the apostles knew Christ. Because they knew he was the Son of God. They knew that he was the Word of God, the Word made flesh. And he's always just always talking about how he loves to see his children walking in truth. This is John. He's talking about his, con his converts, you know. So he's writing letters to these women and writing letters to these churches, you know, and just saying, look, I love that you're walking in truth. You know, it's great that you're just reading and learning. And we need to do that too. We need to keep the word of God close to us and read and learn and study and meditate on the word to walk in truth. And as I said, we're commanded to walk in truth. 
but that comes with the understanding. You have to begin that Jesus is truth. His word is truth. And this King James Bible, this is truth. Because by faith we believe and obey the truth. The only way we can walk in truth is if we have the truth. Amen. And we believe that the King James Bible is the perfect preserved word of God without error in, in the English language. And it is the truth. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, it sure. says, For as much as you know you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So again, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He's always been with the Father. He was with him in the beginning, and the plan was always the same. He was always going to come and die for the sins of men. That was always the plan, because he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And yeah, the truth has also always been settled in heaven. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, says, Who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, under unfeigned love of the brethren, so that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by the which the gospel is preached unto you. Again, this statement would make no sense if we didn't have this. His word, if his word hasn't endured forever, if, if, you know, if all these corruptions out there are the true word of God, then we didn't have it for 2,000 years. Right. So, you know, it's endured forever. And it's endured through the original Greek and Hebrew into the English. And we have the perfect word of God. And of course, the next truth, again, one that we all believe here, but it's a very important, necessary one, is that Jesus is God, because so many deny the deity of Christ. And we've already seen that uh, in several scriptures that God was manifest in the flesh, obviously in 1 John, and of course Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. But in 1 Timothy 3.16 it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And Jesus makes a claim, you know, that he's the Son of God. And it says that Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In John chapter 5, verse 17, I'll get you to turn to John chapter 10, verse 33. But in John chapter 5, verse 17, it says, But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but, also, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Well, we've already seen so many times, God has a Son. Jesus Christ is that Son made flesh. He is the Word made flesh. And in John chapter 10, verse 33, it says, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are gods. If he then called them gods, unto whom the, world, the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, Thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do... Though you believe not me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. So the Jews were accusing Jesus of calling himself God, or the Son of God, and making himself equal with God. But in John 3, 21, it says, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And Jesus was doing more miracles than anyone, proving that he was the Son of God. That's why he did so many miracles. Jesus makes it clear to them that it's not blasphemy because he is the Son of God. 
but the Father sent him, and he does the works of the Father. And we have the witness of the men who saw him do the works of the Father. That's the New Testament. That's the, the Gospels. But they were too stiff-necked to believe Christ, and they attempted to kill him again, but of course he escapes. So we'll see a perspective here from Matthew chapter 16. Um, but this is from somebody who wasn't stiff-necked and who believed that Jesus was God. I'll read to you, it's the same story from Luke chapter 9, verse 20. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And of course, Christ, if we cross-reference the Bible, Christ means Messiah. And in Matthew 16, verse 15, it says, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. So turn over to John chapter 1, and we'll look at John the Baptist also. And these are the witnesses that God left us with to declare the Son unto us, that he is the Son of God. And they were declared to Peter by the Father. In John 1, 29, it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So again, like well and truly the Bible establishes, Jesus is God, Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus is equal with God. There was no blasphemy in the words he said. It was just the stiff-necked people refused to receive the truth. So another truth is that, of course, truth never changes, and God is truth, and God never changes. And that's why it's so foolish, you know, to ignore the Old Testament the laws and statutes of God, because, you know, some will say, oh, that was just replaced with grace. It's all about grace in the New Testament. But no, the Old, the Old Testament and the New Testament, they both testify the same things. It's salvation by grace through faith and the perfect law of liberty, which is there to help us to live a righteous life. It doesn't say, the, the law doesn't save you, but it does save your flesh from the chastisement of God and it saves you from living a terrible life here on earth. That's the pur purpose of the law and the law is as applicable today as it was when it was written. So in Hebrews 13, 8, it says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And that's why, you know, I love that Jesus Christ never changes. The same Jesus Christ who was there in Leviticus is the same Jesus Christ that was there in Matthew. And it's the same one that sits up there with the Father and intercedes on my behalf today. And salvation hasn't changed. There's always been that one truth, you know, believe in the Lord and thou shalt be saved. Whether it was by a different name, whether it was Jehovah or God Almighty in the Old Testament, or whether it's Jesus for the New Testament. It's the same Lord, the same God, the same salvation. So, I'll get you to turn to Romans chapter 4. We're all very familiar with this, but it's just such an amazing chapter. And you can't talk about salvation by grace through faith, not of works, without turning to Romans 4. It's just the greatest chapter on that. But in Romans chapter 4, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. As Brother Sam brought up this morning, like Abraham was justified by works, you know, in, in the sight of other men. And they could see his works. It's the only reason we talk about Abraham. It's the only reason we talk about a lot of these guys is because of their great works, because they maintain the works. But not before God. God wasn't impressed by his works. He wasn't saved by his works. And that's the difference. But we still talk about him because of the great works he did. Moses and, you know, Samuel and a lot of the other guys who just did great works. 
It says, For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessing, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And down to verse 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. But it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered for our offences and was raised again for our justification. So again, the King James Bible is never going to need updating because God's word doesn't change. His salvation doesn't change. In, in uh, Psalm 119, verse 89, of course, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Like, you, you can cha- try and change it as much as you want, corrupt it here on earth. The devil's got a futile fight on his hands because God's already settled his word in heaven. So the word's not going anywhere. And that's why God can preserve it. He's preserved it for us here in the King James Bible in English. And it was preserved in the Greek all the way up until the 1600s when this was translated. But that's why the corrupt versions, they'll change with the times because they're not built on the truth. They're built on lies. And truth is the most important thing. We're to seek wisdom, understanding and knowledge, but we should also seek truth. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. And the truth, that'll be something we have to seek from God, along with all wisdom and instruction and understanding. You know, reading the scriptures, that'll get you all of these if you ask for the Spirit to give you wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and to guide you into all truth. That's the job of the comfort of the Holy Ghost. In uh, You're There in Romans, turn to Romans chapter 10. So, of course, we read from Deuteronomy chapter 30, and that's referencing... Uh, that's referenced here in Romans chapter 10, um, verse 5. It says, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, the man which doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, but who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So I'm not going to go through Deuteronomy chapter 30. That's why I had it read before the service. But that's what it's referencing here. And I do suggest reading it later on and comparing it with Romans chapter 10 in this passage. But it's saying that God was not far from them and neither were the words or commandments of God. The whole passage and the one in Deuteronomy, it's about salvation being nigh and the word being at hand. We don't have to go far at all to find truth. You know, I've got the truth right here in my hand and I believe every word of it. I believe it is truth. And that's why this church, they take the truth to the people, preaching the word of God to them, you know, through the, through the salvation of Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel. And the kingdom of God is just as much at hand today as it was when Christ said it 2,000 years ago. When he arrived, he said, look, the kingdom of God is at hand. And, well, we have the kingdom of God. We have the word of truth. It's right here. So I also want to look at the salvation aspect in that passage. Because the instruction there in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 30 is to choose life or death. But if they believe on the Lord and they cleave to the Lord, then they'll have the righteousness of the Lord. The righteousness is imputed unto us. It's the same way we have it in the New Testament. In Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 it says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. So God will circumcise the heart which according to Romans 2.28 and Colossians 2.11 is salvation. 
Romans 2.28 says, For he's not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he's a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, not of the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And Colossians 2.11 says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So, and the New Testament makes this abundantly clear. You know, the knowledge of the Lord, the truth, it was nigh unto them and they didn't have to go far to find it. You don't have to go up to heaven to bring it back down. You don't have to go down to the depths to bring Christ from the dead to find the word of God or to find the kingdom of God. We have it right here. Every instruction from God. And it also teaches the truth of who God is. You know, and God is three persons. God is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one God. We know that. That's what the Bible says. We believe it because it's the truth. It's those who struggle with that, that uh, I just hate the way they're trying to deceive people into believing, you know. God is like no other. You don't have a God you can compare him to. God is who God is, and he is what he says he is. There's no dispute about that. But it also teaches you just how to live according to the law, how to raise your children, how to have a good marriage. It's all in that book. But the corruptions, they're, they're like the leaven of the Pharisees. You know, the leaven turns the truth into a lie. And even a tiny sliver of a lie makes it all a lie. It's all untrue. If it's no longer, if you take a tiny, just twist one little detail, it's no longer the truth, it's a lie. There is no such thing as a half truth. Or it's, it's all a lie. But that's what these versions do. You know, we have the word of truth from God himself. It's incorruptible, it's pure and perfect because God himself preserved it, as he promised. And we can trust in it. While the devil, devil is the father and author of lies, he's a liar and deceiver. You know, in him is darkness and there's no light in him. But those corrupt versions, that's his handiwork. That's why they're full of lies. And, you know, brother Jason did a great sermon on the New King James Bible, which is just full of lies. Look, it's got some truth in there. But even one bit of a lie makes the whole thing a lie. That whole book is corrupt. So another thing, we should walk in truth and also speak the truth. You know, so God hates a false witness and a lying tongue. Proverbs 6.16 These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an ab abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that are swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. And, you know, in the New Testament it just teaches us, let your yea be yea and your nay nay, just speak the truth. You know, you don't, look, if you, <laughs> if you don't want to do something, just say so. Don't, don't try and, you know, beat around it and say, oh, I don't want to insult this person or whatever, I'll just say yes, even though I don't really want to do that. So just let your yea be yea and your nay nay. Just be a man of your word. People can trust you. People will actually respect you if you're just a man of your word. And in Matthew 5.37, Jesus says, But let your commandment be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more of these cometh of evil. But uh, also in 2 Corinthians 1.18, it says, But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. So how wonderful is it that all of God's promises are yea? You know, there's no, because God cannot lie. So when he promises something, it's all yea. So it's yes, yes, amen. You do have what God promised you. You want eternal life, you believe on his son, you have eternal life. That's a promise that means yea. We can believe every promise of God. And in Jeremiah, you had the pastors and prophets, of course, preaching lies. If you preach the truth, yeah, you're going to be persecuted. But God commands that we preach the truth. That we worship him in spirit and in truth. We worship him how he wants to be worshipped and not how you think he wants to be worshipped. But he says, you know, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, read the word of God, spend time in prayer with him. That's how he wants to be worshipped. You know, don't worship him in the way the world does. You know, with strange fire and incense before the Lord. Though you'll wind up dead if you do that. 
in Jeremiah 4.1, it says, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then, then shalt thou not move, remove, and thou shalt swear, The Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. And the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fellow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come like fire, and burn that none can quench it, because of the evil of your doings. So we have to return to the Lord and his truth. Circumcise the hearts with the circumcision made without hands. Look, they were, I'm sure they were all circumcised in the flesh. But God wants a circumcision of your heart, which is believing on his son, believing on the Lord. And they didn't believe the truth. They weren't saved and they had to trust in the Lord. And Jeremiah 7, 28 says, But thou shalt say unto them, This is the nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. And you can just see that, like reading the Old Testament, you know, which I hope we've all done, but you see the downfall of Israel through when the truth has perished and the men preach lies. And there are good preachers like Jeremiah, they're preaching the truth, but of course they're hated by everybody for preaching the truth. But they'll always yoke up with these people and listen to the ones who preach lies, those lying preachers, those false prophets, whom God says I didn't send. And you know the type, you know, those positive only preachers. They don't preach the judgment and wrath of God as God commands us to. He said, look, in truth and judgment. Again, truth and judgment go together. You know, God is truth and God is judgment. But they never, they never preach judgment. And they never preach truth. But we had good preachers like Jeremiah, Isaiah, and of course all the other prophets of the Bible. So again, we see, you know, these people reject the truth. We see here in um, where are we? Jeremiah 8, verse 8, it says, How do ye say we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us? Lest certainly in vain made he it, the pen of the scribes is in vain. So when you reject the truth that God's given you, he's given us the King James Bible, but for them the word was scribed in vain. And if you don't read the Bible you don't believe it, if you don't trust or hearken to what it says, then you too, the, the Bible is scribed for you in vain. There's no point you even having it. The word's only good if you read it, if you, if you believe it, if you cherish it. And Jeremiah said that there was no truth, that the people were all liars in his day. And he, in this passage I'm about to read, he says he prefers a stranger who speaks truth to lodge with over his neighbor and his brother who's a liar and a slanderer. And that's why we should not walk as liars and slanderers, as backbiters, but we should walk in truth and walk speaking the truth. And, you know, I can understand that <laughs> liars and slanderers, they're not good people. They're not fun to be around. So I can understand why you'd say such a thing. If you want to turn to 2 Corinthians verse 1, chapter 1, sorry. And I'll read from Jeremiah 9, verse 2. It says, O oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them. For they be all adulterers and assembly of treacherous men, and they bend their tongues like their bow for lies. But they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. So that's why we want to be yoked up with people who know the Lord people who walk in truth. And that's why John, you know, when he wrote those books of the, the, his converts, he was so happy that they were walking in truth. And how, you know, it's great to have a church that walks in truth. It's why we can all come together and we can feel there's such a great unity here. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth, comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them also which are in trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Now, of course, the, you know, this next truth is that the truth of God comforts us. To us who are saved, it's a comfort unto us. 
Uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, it says, But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. And in verse 31 of the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. So I don't know about you, but I certainly find the Word of God comforting. You know, hearing the Word of God, it's comforting unto us who are His children. The truth is comfort unto us. And even when I read it or I hear a preacher and I'm admonished by it, I'm still comforted by it. You know, so when I quote scriptures to others, often they're comforted by the words that are spoken. And that's how it should be. Even if there's an admonishment in that word for that person, you know, they can still be comforted by that because there's comfort in the truth. There's no comfort in lies. You know, lies are only there to deceive. The comfort comes from the truth. Um, I'll turn to, if you want to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. First Thessalonians 4, verse 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others would have no hope. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Like, there's so many words, so many passages in Scripture that are just comforting unto us. Knowing that the Lord is going to come back for us, that's comforting for us. Knowing that we're going to get our new heavenly bodies, you know, at, at the resurrection, that's comforting to us. You know, we can appreciate that because we love God and we love truth. And, and that's just one of the truths that gives us comfort. Like the fact that Jesus is God, Jesus is the Son of God, the fact He came and died for us, was raised again from the dead, that's all comforting for us. You know, and that's why we should comfort each other with these words and find comfort in the Word of God, in the truth of God. So what I want you to take away from this, that Jesus is truth and every word of this book is truth. You know, God preserved his word for us today in the King James Bible. And I want you to know that you can trust every word. Every promise of God is yea. And every instruction of righteousness is for your good. Even the chastisement we receive at his hand. In uh, John chapter 1 verse 43 it says, The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip, finding Nathanael, said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And in verse 49 it says, Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. So, but if Philip wasn't reading the word, if he didn't believe what Moses wrote, if he didn't believe he had the word of God, then he wouldn't have known that Jesus was the son of God, that he was the Messiah or the Christ of God. And of course we have the story of the, the man who... Uh, was a rich, rich man and Lazarus. And he, uh, he went into hell. It's a story, not a parable, because there are names. But uh, in verse 30 of Luke 16, it says, Then he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rose from the dead. So again, we have the word of truth right here. We've got the writings of Moses and the prophets. In the Old Testament, we have the writings of the witnesses of the New Testament, the ones who are with Christ, who witnessed Christ, who witnessed what he went through and have given us that word of truth. So those who seek the truth, they're going to find the truth. You know, Jesus said, whosoever seeketh findeth. He's not going to withhold himself from somebody who's seeking the truth, but with a genuine heart. Now, I found salvation through the truth movement because if, if you're looking for truth, you'll eventually find God at the end of the truth because God is the author of all truth. 
And at that point, you have a choice to either receive or reject that ultimate truth, because the end of all truth is Christ. And when you believe in Christ and his truth, you receive the comforter, that Holy Spirit of promise. So this is the last passage, about to wrap up now. In John 3.31 it says, He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all, and what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth. And no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set his seal to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath, hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So there's no other, God that'll, there's no other book that will teach you about God than this one. You can't learn in any other book written by any man you can't learn anything except what's in this book. This is who God is. People might th have an idea of who, they are, of who God is, but God tells us who he is. He's not hiding himself from us if we seek the truth. You know, that book contains all truth, so we just need to read it and believe it. You know, and it is your lifeline in this wicked and dying world, so you should hold on to it. It's important. To teach others the perfect gospel of salvation by faith also contained in this book. And again, not the corrupt versions. They don't teach salvation by grace through faith. They teach a lie. And we're to also instruct them in the, in the Father's perfect will and to let the words of God and truth comfort you. So again, when you're reading, if you're admonished, just remember that the admonishment's there to make you better. God wants to chastise you because he loves you. And we can be comforted by all the promises that are in the book. So do you mind praying for us, Brother Caleb? Uh, dear Father,